we have the launch of the second uh, orbital flight test of the Starliner spacecraft uh, tomorrow. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the importance of, of this mission and how important it is to NASA to have uh, two crew vehicles uh, being able to rotate astronauts to and from the space station? Uh, remember, after we shut down the space shuttle, we had to rely on our partners, our friends, the Russians, and their Soyuz to get to and from the space station with crew. And so uh, it was a long time coming uh, because we had to get it right. When you're flying humans, you've got to have it right. And uh, so lo and behold, in the competition between SpaceX and Boeing, a lot of people thought that Boeing would be the first one, uh, but SpaceX now has flown three crews already to the International Space Station. Uh, so this one is very important. Uh, they had a malfunction on the software on the first time. Uh, it wasn't a, a total uh, failure because uh, the rocket performed, the spacecraft performed, but it didn't get it into the right orbit. And so uh, had there been a crew on it, they would have been safe. But uh, of course we like to fly them without a crew uh, before we put a crew in the spacecraft. So that's what this one is uh, tomorrow. And it is very, very important that we have this sustained capability of getting crew and cargo to the International Space Station. Uh, assuming this mission goes uh, well tomorrow, uh, tomorrow and, and the docking goes well and the landing goes well, uh, what's the soonest we could see NASA crew flying on Starliner? I think by the end of the year, first of next year, uh, and I think uh, if this one goes well, there's no reason that that won't occur. Uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the other big program at KSC over in the VAB. The uh, space launch system is nearly fully stacked at this point for Artemis 1. Uh, can you update me on how those preparations are going? Are you still holding on to a potential launch this year or is it more likely to be next year? Uh, it'll be toward the end of the year. Uh, I saw the hardware yesterday being stacked. Oh, it's beautiful. And it's big. Uh, it, it makes you think back uh, to the Apollo days and the Saturn V. And of course, to us uh, back then, over a half century ago, that was just uh, amazingly large and powerful. And this one is larger and more powerful. Um, what else has to go right between now and the launch uh, to be able to maintain a potential launch this year? Is, is, it any, is it any big deal if it does slip to 2022 schedule-wise? Well, if it does, it'll be in early uh, 2022. Uh, but uh, I think everything's on course. Everything looks good. Uh, all of uh, their timing has been met. Uh, you know, they had a little delay on the test of the engine uh, out at Mississippi Stennis Space Center. However, uh, when all of those four babies fired up, uh, they went for over eight minutes, which is how much time it takes to get to orbit. And uh, they were performing well. And by the way, those are some engines that I have a great deal of reliability because uh, those were the space shuttle main engines. The, the other big launch this year for NASA, probably more than just one more, but uh, JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, um, launching in the November, December timeframe, I think. Uh, the European Space Agency has a big launch tomorrow with the Ariane 5 uh, to sort of test out the systems and test out some modifications for JWST, um, will you be watching that launch and how important is that launch to ensure uh, James Webb gets off the ground this year? Well, we did better than that. We sent uh, Dr. Thomas uh, Zerbakken down to French Guiana 
because it seems the only holdup that we would see for uh, James Webb is whether or not these two Ariannes that fly before uh, JWST, if they get off uh, safely and on time. And we wanted uh, Dr. Z to go down there and check all of that out. Uh, so uh, he'll report to us on what he sees. Uh, on the spacecraft of the observatory side, no issues uh, getting that ready for shipment, as you're aware of right now? Uh, the spacecraft on what? The spacecraft, uh, JWST, it's uh, oh, yeah. getting ready oh, to go. That, oh, that's ready to go. Yeah, that's ready to go. Uh, Bob Cabana was out in California two weeks ago. Uh, he saw them packing it up. It's ready to go. And uh, another, uh, back to Artemis, uh, another question I had on that was the, uh, the status of the HLS uh, procurement. Uh, I know the GAO is going to come back potentially next week, uh, if that's still the schedule, uh, on a ruling on uh, Blue Origin's protest. Um, do you still expect a, a ruling next week? And, and could next week kind of be a big week for uh, the human landing system program? Well, I anticipate that they will uh, give us a ruling on uh, time. Uh, it's supposed to be by August the 4th. And then uh, once we have that legal determination, then we'll proceed. I'm sure you've seen uh, the letter from uh, Jeff Bezos uh, uh, earlier this week about offering uh, some, some additional private funding for a second HLS provider. Um, you know, have you seen that? What was your reaction to that? And uh, is that something that's sort of percolating through the uh, NASA system right now and how to act on that? Uh, we are in a blackout period and under the rules and procedures under law of the General Accounting Office, uh, we are mute until they render their decision. Okay. Um, can you talk more generally about the importance of competition in that program? I've talked about that till I'm blue in the face. So uh, what, what would be the benefit? Uh, talk to me about it. What would be the benefit of having two providers potentially? Well, I've talked to you all several times about it. Uh, take, for example, uh, Boeing and SpaceX on the uh, human uh, to orbit on the space station. Uh, had we not had two in the competition, uh, it's possible we would still be on the ground. Proof's in the pudding. And uh, before I let you go, um, sort of, uh, you know, there's been a lot of questions, a lot of attention on the relationship between NASA and Roscosmos going forward, uh, not only in Artemis, but uh, future of low Earth orbit uh, operations with the ISS and a future low Earth orbit platform. How would you gauge the relationship you have with Dmitry Rogozin and the broader relationship between NASA and Roscosmos this moment? Dmitry is my friend and the Russians are our partner. And the Russians have been our partner ever since the middle of the Cold War when it was the Soviet Union, uh, when an American spacecraft and uh, a Soviet spacecraft rendezvoused and docked and the crews lived together uh, for nine days uh, that was 1975, and ever since, uh, the then Soviets and now Russians uh, have been our partners. Uh, the head of uh, one of their uh, space divisions, uh, Sergei Krikalov, is uh, someone who is admired throughout the astronaut corps. Uh, so uh, they are our partners and they are our friends, and they have helped us build the International Space Station. And they're gonna to continue to be our partners and we're gonna extend the International Space Station. I hope uh, the bill that I had passed when I was last in the Senate was to extend it to 2030. I believe the Congress this year uh, will in fact uh, do 
the extension to 2030. Are you still um, hoping to have Roscosmos be part of the Artemis program going forward? And uh, would they need to sign the Artemis Accords to, to do that? I hope so. And the, you're, the, still, the prerequisite is still to have them sign the Artemis Accords if they so chose. And to uh, participate with us on the gateway. Right, right. And that uh, uh, participation from Russia in the gateway, I know they were at one point uh, providing an airlock and uh, that seems to be up in the air right now, correct? I don't know. Okay, Mr. Administrator, well, thank you for your time and uh, it was good to chat with you and uh, hope to talk again sometime down the road. Thanks so much. Have a good day.